Most producers and filmmakers aren't trying to actively deceive. I mean, I, I, there are exceptions, there are charlatans, but most people are just trying to make a show. Most media I work with work very hard to get this right. My background is in particle physics, and if there's a new story about particle physics, I can kind of guess whether it's a, a good news story or an accurate news story, or whether it's gobbledygook. But on almost any other scientific issue, it's not my area. So when something comes on the news, I've got no idea whether it's, it's, it's a valid news story, whether it's giving a balanced picture of the research, or whether it's sensationalist nonsense. But there is definitely the few, especially tabloids, coming out of the UK, which seem to be pulling information out of thin air that it doesn't mean anything, it's not true, it's completely false, it's being made up. And therefore, if, if the news or the, you know, the newspapers get it wrong, the public is going to be misled very, very rapidly. The only problem is when something is nonsense, but presented with a veneer of informative. Like, hey, hang on, I, I'm not sure you are a real scientist, guy in a lab coat in that shampoo commercial. A writer, a director, and a producer, they go for lunch at Cantor's Deli, and they all order the borscht. Right, so the borscht comes, and the writer tastes it first. Wow, man, this is, I gotta say, this is good borscht. You know, a little salt, a little pepper, doesn't need much. This is really, really good borscht. Now the director tastes it, he says, man, man, this is fantastic. Just a little touch of sour cream. This is outstanding borscht. And then the producer tastes it, he goes, this is the best borscht I have ever had in my life. This borscht is perfect. I'm gonna piss in it. <laughs> Right? Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? My name is David S. Anderson. I am an archaeologist. I received my PhD from Tulane University in New Orleans. My research specialty has been looking at uh, formative or pre-classic Maya society. Ancient Aliens has been around for a long while, and the show itself is an homage to Eric von Donneken's work, Chariots of the Gods, which was, you know, all in all, it's the same sort of alien astronaut hypothesis all concocted together, suggesting that all of these uh, monuments and pieces of rock art and whatnot around the world somehow show signs of alien contact in the ancient world. At the Museum of Natural History in New York City, there is a Olmec figurine. He is clearly wearing some type of a pressurized suit. He has some type of controls with tubes on his chest. On the side, you have six wings coming out of him. In my opinion, it is the smoking gun of our ancestors having access to aviation technology thousands of years ago. One of the classics that Von Donneken himself pushed and has been pushed by the show uh, is this notion that the sarcophagus lid of Pakal, who is a Maya ruler of a city of Palenque. Arguably the most remarkable Mayan artifact ever found, the stone sarcophagus lid of King Pakal has produced considerable controversy. Mainstream scholars believe the depiction is of King Pakal on a journey to the underworld. But ancient astronaut theorists believe the king is portrayed seated at the controls of a spacecraft and have dubbed him the Palenque astronaut. He appears to be going into space. He's the original rocket man. And so if they take that sarcophagus lid out of context and show it to somebody who's never looked at a piece of my art before and say, look. We have maintained that the depiction here is of King Pakal sitting in some type of a spacecraft. The reality is, is that, you know, if you've never looked at a piece of Maya art before, it looks pretty weird. There's squiggly lines everywhere, and it's not something that you and I have a lot of familiarity with in our day-to-day -day lives. It generally suggests that human uh, society and even human evolution was influenced by uh, these aliens. Millions of people around the world 
believe we have been visited in the past by extraterrestrial beings. What if it were true? The style of questioning, the show continues, and Don Von Donneken was very big on this in his original book. The original book was titled Cherry to the Gods, question mark. He's used this for a long time to sort of back out of any time anyone corners him and says, well, you know, what about this evidence or what about this? Uh, and he can just say, well, I'm just asking questions. Just asking questions is an old politician trick because it just puts an idea in people's mind. Like, if it turned out that my opponent was an axe murderer, how would it make you feel about him? I'm just asking, it's just a question. Did ancient aliens really help to shape our history? And if so, did they plot the success and demise of the ancient Maya civilization? The answer could always be yes or no. So you're asking, you're not saying anything. They certainly prime the audience and the show does the same thing where they say, well, they're just asking questions and you know, what's wrong with asking questions? Like, well, what's the title of the show? Do you think it's possible that a TV network has got hours and hours and hours of TV out of an obvious bullshit charade? It's just a question, it's just a question. They don't realize the damage that they're actually doing. All they're caring about is the ratings. They couldn't care less whether it's true, whether it's not true, they just want the ratings. And so the sensationalism is what really gets the ratings, that's what gets the sponsors, that's what gets the money in for them, that's what gets them another season, and it's those things that sell. These shows are there to get you to watch them. They're there to make money, to be entertaining. They're not there to give you accurate information. I think most scientists and my friends in particular in the skeptics community, they understand how this works. I'm Matt Kirshen. I'm a host of the Probably Science podcast. We talk to a lot of scientists who are experts in their field. So I know a fair amount about science for someone whose actual job is telling jokes to drunk people. If you're debating, like an evolutionary scientist is, is debating a creationist in a venue and a format chosen by the creationist so that they can promote their bill to teach creationism in the public schools, I would not do that. I would not go into that type of situation. The movie Expelled, I think, is an example of a time when scientists should not have allowed themselves to be videotaped or to be used by a documentary. I was approached by one of the producers and he said it was going to be an objective account of controversy over intelligent design. And uh, he didn't use the word expelled. And he gave me every impression that he was properly scientifically educated. It was time to ask the scientific establishment what was so bad about intelligent design? Intelligent design people are not genuine scientists. Explicitly said it was going to be on the side of science, but the film was not going to be a creationist uh, front. Hello, writer. Professor Dawkins. How are you? I'm Ben Stein. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. How are you? Fine, thank you. I thought this was an honest film. I, had, I didn't know where they were coming from. Richard Dawkins is so confident that evolution is a fact and that therefore God doesn't exist that he has devoted his entire life to spreading the evolution gospel. At one point he asked me whether I could think under any circumstances of um, ways in which intelligent design could have produced life on Earth. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? So I'm a scientist and I thought under any circumstances, right, the only circumstances I can think of, and they're highly unlikely and I don't believe it. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer. Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Wait a minute. <laughs> Richard Dawkins believes in little green men. That may not have been exactly what he said. Well, but uh, that higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. The clear implication was that I was advocating uh, the idea that, that alien life had um, 
succeeded uh, life on Earth. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. It was only then that I began to realize where Ben Stein was coming from. Just once and for all, do you think we came from space aliens? No. <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, there's a problem that TV shows are using the rules of TV to apply to science. But also there's a problem that scientists going on these shows are using the rules of science and trying to take them to an entertainment show. And they're not the same, they clash. There are shows that are honest and, and you know, have integrity and are making sure that they accurately represent their experts. Other times it's by misportraying or mischaracterizing what an expert says for a given narrative. What often happens, of course, is that the scientific side of things gets left on the editing room floor. So I'll give you one example. I was contacted by the producers of a show called Strange Evidence. What's the truth behind this strange evidence? And I was asked to examine about a half dozen mysterious viral videos and explain what was going on in them and is there a plausible real explanation for them. One was a video of a police chase. Uh, and it was this car that apparently went through a chain link fence. There was no way for him to get out. I got fences on both sides of the road. So I'm good here, I've got him. What happens next leaves Daniels dumbfounded. This is where he decides to make his hard left turn. And the next thing all you see is dust. And as this dust is continuing to settle, I can see these two little red lights bouncing, going through this field. I'm like, oh my God. A car just disappeared through a chain link fence. And people think, how, how did this car go through this fence? Many believe a supernatural force is at play. It was almost as if the car dematerialized and then rematerialized on the other side of the fence. I gave them a rundown. Here's this mysterious video. This is why it's weird. And here's what's actually going on here. They used none of it. All they used was me saying one sentence, which is, it's weird, right? It's creepy. People are like, what the hell is going on here? As if I'm endorsing that. I wasn't endorsing that. I was characterizing what the public was saying. They made it appear like I was endorsing a mystery that, that I found unexplainable. When in fact, I just spent 20 minutes explaining the mystery that they characterized me as saying, well, who knows? It wasn't just me. They did the same thing to a lot of my colleagues. In fact, there was a, a cryptozoologist named Scott Martis. What did Ben say? They totally misrepresented him, too. I don't know that guy. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, okay, I know him. I consider myself a cryptozoological investigator slash amateur naturalist. And I was contacted by this production company called Strange Evidence because they wanted to do a segment on the Lake Champlain monster. Everyone's talking about Champy, this mysterious monster that supposedly lives in the depths. The theme of this show is analysis of mysterious video clips and, and what's the true explanation for them. So I asked what particular piece of video evidence that's alleged to be of Champ do you want to analyze? Oh my God, it's Champ. I know, I see it. We got it on tape. The piece of footage, which I was already familiar with that they wanted to analyze was a piece of video footage taken by a woman named Katie Elizabeth, who also investigates the Lake Champlain monster. I saw his disturbance, and then all of a sudden, his hump rose to the surface of the water, dark in color. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Katie believes she caught a glimpse of a living creature that belongs to the prehistoric past. If she's right, this could be rare video footage of the monster of Lake Champlain, the legendary Champy. The video that they wanted me to look at, I already had an opinion about. It was a standing wave, which is a wave phenomenon with water. And what that is, is when two waves coming in two different directions bump into each other and cancel each other out and roll over and over and over again in one spot. And it can look like a black object sitting in the water it's very similar to another piece of footage that was shot at Loch Ness in August of 1992. The beautiful ruins of Urquhart Castle, one of the biggest tourist attractions in Scotland. It was here that a tourist videotaped an unknown creature in August 1992. 
I got that piece of video and chopped it out of the documentary and stuck it right up next to the Lake Champlain video where you can look at the Lake Champlain video and then immediately go to the Loch Ness one. And it's perfectly obvious that it's the same phenomenon from a documentary. And they also have an expert talking about how that video shows the interference pattern of two waves slamming into each other. Now the object is, looks as if it's the interference pattern of two wakes that have come together and are forming interference between each other, forming what looks like an object, but isn't really anything more than just water. I sent this to the producers of Strange Evidence to impress upon them that that's what this video shows. And it was a really a waste of time to discuss it on this program like it's anything to do with some kind of weird animal. But they insisted on going ahead with this. Cryptozoologist Scott Martis collects reports from the lake that go back over 150 years, and he sees an astonishing pattern emerge. They ask me for what they called bumper footage. What people are describing seems to resemble this prehistoric marine reptile from the age of the dinosaurs. Going back almost 150 years, there have been steady reports of some kind of a monsterish or dinosaurish creature in the lake. They wanted me to act like this is some big mystery that they're going to use coming into the show or going out of the show to grab people's interest around the commercials. There is somewhere between 250 and 300 sightings of this thing. And there are also bits and pieces of impressive photographic and video evidence. That would have been fine if they had used the rest of the interview. They chose just to use the first part of the interview and not use the part where I'm talking about an explanation, which is grounded in reality. And yet they chose to ignore that and just leave it open-ended like, okay, it could have been a monster. Whatever is creating these monstrous sights and sounds in the lake, Katie Elizabeth isn't going to give up her quest to find out. I believe that Champ is out there. The holy grail would be to get a biological specimen to prove to science that Champ exists. And I think it is just the beginning. I was almost embarrassed to talk about it. After having this bad experience with strange evidence, I was done with them. When they called again, I said, screw off, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. Then they called back and said, well, you know, it's, it got picked up for another season. We'd really like to have you. And I said, I feel like I was mischaracterized on your show. I'm not happy about that. And they said, well, it's different producers. There's, you know, there's been change up. Can we have you on? I'm like, okay, fine. But because I had concerns about the first season, I decided to record everything so that I would have a record of what I actually said. Okay, so we're rolling. So right. It's not like it's a bird shape thing. Yeah. First of all, it has no wings. So it's not flying. It's, it's basically a sort of a amorphous, vertical, cocoon-like figure with no real features to it. And sure enough, there are two glaring examples of how they misrepresented me. Here's the first. There's a palpable fear of brujas in Mexico. They can hurt you, they can kill you. Yeah, they did it again. Now here it is in context. There's a palpable fear of brujas in Mexico. They can hurt you, they can kill you. I mean, there's, there's this very strong belief that the, the black magic and the dark arts are very real and are going on in modern day. By removing the word belief, they're making it sound like I believe the brujas exist and are dangerous. Here's another one. Just some ancient witchcraft. This is going on today. And once again, here it is in context. This isn't just some ancient witchcraft belief that died out uh, during the same witch trials. This is going on today. If someone asks me for my opinion on something and I go on camera, I've spent hours, weeks, in some cases, years researching this. If you don't care what I'm saying, if you don't care that I'm an expert on these things that I've written books about, then why am I here? I'm agreeing to come on your show to help educate your audience. Don't turn me into a liar. It's sort of a two-way street, right? I mean, science, it does get misrepresented by the media. And, and as we discussed, sometimes it's due to uh, malign intent. Other times it's done by accident. Um, and other times it's, it's actually the scientist's fault. I have a responsibility to describe what I do in a cogent way that um, a general person can understand. I was contacted by a production team from Dangerous Limited for a documentary series called Clash of the Dinosaurs. When I watched the final cut of the documentary, 
I realized that my words had been twisted to make it look as if I was presenting an idea that I don't actually accept. Moving a mountain of flesh requires sophisticated coordination. One of the curious things about sauropods is that they did have a swelling in the spinal cord in the neighborhood of their pelvis. This was sort of like a second brain to help control the back half of the body. It's called the sacrolumbar expansion, a bundle of nerves which acts like a primitive brain controlling the movements of the legs and tail. The brain in a Sora Poseidon's head is simply too small and far away to coordinate its front and back legs. So like a prehistoric fire truck, a second brain operates the back end of the animal. So there I was watching the documentary on TV and I see myself saying the words that I had said, but with the framing removed so that the meaning was actually turned around 180 degrees. What they did is take a, out the part where I said, there was an old idea that, and then the, but now we know, and just left me saying. They did have a swelling in the spinal cord in the neighborhood of their pelvis. This was sort of like a second brain to help control the back half of the body. And left me just saying this old disproven idea that I actually don't accept. It had completely reversed the meaning of what I said. Probably the most blatant example of uh, TV distortion of science would be the Oprah show that I did. And this was during the rise of Rosemary Altia as a popular psychic in America. Psychics hide behind this ingenious phrase for entertainment purposes only, which is a very technical legal expression that means I am a liar, but not in a way that you can sue me for. She was doing cold reading stuff as is typical. I'm thinking when you get to the spirit world, you can say, had enough, old enough, don't want to grow anymore. <laughs> It was pitched that uh, Oprah was interested in exploring this idea of New Age spiritualism through psychics who talk to the dead. All right, children grow. Children, children grow. grow. Children grow in the spirit world. They grow, they develop, they, you know, they... I, I will often see someone who died at six years old and maybe it was 10 years ago and now, them, now I'll see them at 16. They flew me in and, and um, I took the limo over to the studio the next morning. Uh, for the taping, and there were a few people in the in the limo with me that were staying at the same hotel, and so we were just chatted. And you know, what are you doing here? Oh, I got a reading from the psychic uh, yesterday. I'm like, oh, how'd it go? You know, blah blah blah. You know, so then uh, you know we're in the studio, and Rosemary Lt is reading the audience as they do. You know, I'm getting somebody over here with an R name, and I'm getting somebody over here with a grandfather, and you know, nothing was working. The audience was pretty silent. And I thought, wow, okay, well, maybe there's nothing for me to explain. And then all of a sudden, she turns to this woman that was in the car with me. I'm I'm aware of a lady who died of cancer who's trying to oh, connect God, in with you. Oh God, don't. Um, I don't. I'm I'm going to get up if I may. Um, she uh, tells me she was uh, very sick prior to her dying. She's talking about her middle areas here yes, being very badly yes. affected. And the guy next to her is her son who was in the car with me. And, you know, it's like he, he was spilling out all this amazing stuff that she knew. She says, you've taken a new step with your study, with uh, your training. Yeah. You've been so What have confused. you done? I'd like to know. What have you done? What well, new step have you taken? This is my last year of school and I'm graduating. Um... I don't want you to tell me anything. Okay. Can well, I do I did. this? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I see somebody standing behind you. She keeps tapping you on the shoulder, and uh, I know he looks behind. <laughs> and everybody was astonished by this because it really looked like it was an impressive pull from on high. So then Oprah mics me and says, okay, how do you explain this, Dr. Shermer? I said, well, actually, that particular one, she had already did a reading the day before, and they were with the, in the car with me earlier today, and that's how I know this. Boom, that got edited out, gone, when the show aired. They left the part where, you know, the reading looks great, but without the explanation. And I thought, you know, that's, that's really deceptive. That is, that's wrong. I mean, that's immoral. My name is Dr. Emily Bailey, and I'm an assistant professor at Texas Tech Health Sciences Center in Abilene, Texas. I was trained in virology at Duke University and in water microbiology at the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Zubin Damania, AKA ZDog MD. All right, about a million people have sent me this clip Plandemic, and I got to admit, I am shook. A documentary film called Plandemic was released on YouTube and focused on the anti-scientific beliefs of Judy Mikovits. Dr. Judy Mikovits has been called one of the most accomplished scientists of her generation. The first five seconds of that video, 
reeks of crazy sauce. At the height of her career, Dr. Mikovits published a blockbuster article in the journal Science. The controversial article sent shockwaves through the scientific community as it revealed that the common use of animal and human fetal tissues were unleashing devastating plagues of chronic diseases. For exposing their deadly secrets, the minions of Big Pharma waged war on Dr. Mikovits, destroying her good name, career, and personal life. If you do a simple Google search, you can find out the main claim of the video is that she was falsely arrested with no charges for like going against Fauci or something. No, she was arrested because she took, stole equipment, notes, and data from a lab that she was fired from. As the fate of nations hang in the balance, Dr. Mikovits is naming names of those behind the plague of corruption that places all human life in danger. One of the things she says in the film is that people who get the flu vaccine are 36% more likely to get COVID-19. The game is to prevent the therapies till everyone is infected and push the vaccines knowing that the flu vaccines increase the odds by 36% of getting COVID-19. Where does that data come from? A publication last year where the military who had been vaccinated with influenza were more susceptible to coronaviruses. This paper doesn't say that at all. What this paper actually does say is that people who get the influenza vaccine have a 1.36 odds greater chance of developing coronavirus. This paper focuses on coronaviruses that circulate in the human population every year, and these are the ones that cause the common cold. They are not SARS. SARS-CoV at all. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes the illness COVID-19. COVID-19 did not exist when this paper was written. This family of viruses was manipulated and studied in a laboratory where the animals were taken into the laboratory and this is what was released, whether deliberate or not. That cannot be naturally occurring. No, at this time we do not have any evidence that this virus was manipulated in a laboratory. If it was a natural occurrence, it would take it, it up to 800 years to occur. There's a popular paper on the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, and this represents the current consensus on the origin of this virus. The structure of this virus is different than the other viruses in the same family. Viruses typically have families, they're grouped together in this way, and this virus does not look like the others in its family. It's different. And if you were going to manipulate it in a lab, you would have taken one of the other family members and modified it to make a new one rather than starting with something new. For me, it's the great news that the doctors are waking up and saying, wait a minute. They, they go, and doctors have been saying, and then they show a chiropractor. You, you doctors that are watching this, and I see a lot of you right here. Why are you not getting loud? I'm here to defend you. I'm here to defend my freedoms. I'm here to defend my family's freedoms, my patients' rights to choose what to do with their life. I'm just blown away, and I'm blown away why there are not more doctors like me talking about this all over the place. It's the same chiropractor that I've railed against. It's not the scientists who are in any way dishonest. They're listening to people who for more than 40 years have controlled who gets funded, what gets published. She was known for, in 2009, putting out a paper saying that chronic fatigue syndrome was caused by a murine virus. Well, it turns out that paper was retracted from science when they realized no one could replicate it and her methods and science were completely shoddy. And I'm sorry to say many, many people will simply take the money and the fame and that support things that absolutely aren't true. Now, ever since then, she's been on a mission to try to prove to people that she's not crazy. And this video does not help that. YouTube actually had to take down this video multiple times. And there's been a lot of discussion about platforms taking down videos and labeling tweets and things like that. But in this case, uh, misinformation and science, it's probably better that it came down earlier rather than later. After having watched the whole thing, I am shook that Americans are so freaking stupid as to take even a second of this horrible garbage conspiracy nonsense, seriously. Dr. Bailey, what is your peer review of Plandemic? It's definitely a reject. 
Certainly, I've seen on occasion my colleagues be misrepresented, and uh, my uh, friend and, and mentor Ken Fader is one who has certainly encountered this before. My name is Ken Fader. I'm a professor of anthropology here at Central Connecticut State University. I've been doing archaeology in southern New England for almost 45 years now. Archaeology struggles with this notion of how do we publicly promote what we're doing and get people to be aware of what we're doing. We're sitting in my lab, my archaeology lab. Around us are artifacts that we've recovered from sites here in southern New England over the past 40 years of digging. And then on the floor are all these objects that are produced by my students replicating archaeological artifacts. Ken was films talking about Atlantis and the, the lore and legends around this, this, this notion. I get an email from a colleague of mine and he says, hey Ken, I just got an email from an independent production company. They, they're looking for an archaeologist for their documentary about Atlantis, the lost continent of Atlantis. So they get in touch with me. And we had a really nice talk. The, the production assistant, really, really cool guy, smart guy. And I'm talking about Atlantis. And yes, I've written the chapter of the book about it. I've done a little bit of research. I've read the original dialogues. So yeah, for sure, I can talk about Atlantis and I've done it before. And he's thrilled about it. Oh, this is great. This is exactly what we're looking for. And at the end of the conversation, he says, Oh, by the way, Ken, just so we're sure, just so we're clear about this, we kind of need you to say in the show, as a credentialed archaeologist who's worked for years doing archaeology, we need you to say that Atlantis was real. No, it's a story made up by Plato. It's about how a perfect society would react when it's existentially threatened. And that's what I'll say if you interview me. And he said, oh, well, we, we, we get the fact that you don't, we're, we're familiar with your, your skepticism. But for the sake of this show, you're going to need to say it's real. He had an agenda, and he didn't understand why I couldn't change my perspective just for the sake of the show. His narrative was it had to be real. So I said, no, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm a scientist, and I have to go where the evidence leads me. The evidence leads me to the conclusion that, no, Atlantis was a story made up by this very important Greek philosopher. He said, well, yeah, can we understand that? We get that. But you have to understand, for, from our perspective, we need a scientist to say it's real. That's, that's the story. They said, well, then it's not a documentary that you're doing a work of fiction. And that's when he asked me, he said, Ken, why are you so adamant about this? Why do you think Atlantis wasn't real? I said, just, just don't ask me any questions. Just listen to my story. So long, long ago, there was an evil empire. And that evil empire militarily powerful, technologically sophisticated, economically very wealthy. And they were bent on taking over. Anybody who stood in their way, they wiped them out. Well, the only one group of people standing in their way of complete domination was a small ragtag group of rebels. But they had something going for them that the evil empire didn't have. Everything was done equitably and fairly and, in fact, perfectly. And when that evil empire entered into their domain and tried to wipe them out, this small ragtag group was able to defeat that enemy. What story have I just told you? What, what Star Wars? No, I was telling you the Atlantis story. He said, what do you mean? Atlantis is a plot device, not a real place. Star Wars, Atlantis, it's the same thing. Nobody asks George Lucas, Wait a minute, George. This really happened? No, everybody knows it's fiction. At the time, like 350 BC, they didn't say, Plato, is that real? No, they understood it to be a metaphor. So of course, I'm not gonna say Atlantis was real because I know it wasn't. The guy said, Ken, I love that story. That's a great story. Can I get back to you? I said, sure. He gets back to me. He says, my producer loves that it's going to appeal to the right demographic. He said, oh, yeah, well, there's, there's the thing, though. You don't have to say it's real. I said, okay, great, I'm not going to. But can you be a fence sitter? I said, what? Yeah, can you kind of, you go both ways with it. Say, well, it might not be real, but maybe it will be real. And I said, no, no, dude. What's, what is the point of all of this? Why do you want me to say something that I absolutely and categorically disagree with? It doesn't make any sense. And the guy goes, oh, you're making it really hard on us, Ken, because we really want you to be in this. And I said, look, I'm sorry. I cannot, I, I would be guilty of malpractice 
Imagine if I were a physician and you came to me and said, Ken, we need you to say this drug works great. And I say, but, but the evidence shows that it doesn't. And you go, yeah, but for the sake of the story, we need you, we need you to say, yeah, it works great. I would be guilty of medical malpractice. I can't do this. Now, in my recollection of this conversation, the next thing he said was, all right, Ken, tell you what. You can be on the show, say whatever you want, but we'll give you cover. We'll edit it so that it makes it sound like you're kind of a fence sitter. You can tell your colleagues you didn't say exactly what we made it out to be in the show. And then I asked the question. This was the big question. I said, why do you want me to say something I don't believe in? Why do you want me to say that Atlantis is real? There was quiet on the end of the phone. And he says, I want to ask you a question, Ken. And this, I can't tell you anything directly. I'll ask questions. He says to me, we are an independent production company. We've been hired by ABC, the network, to do this. Yes, so? And he says, well, you do know who owns ABC. And I say, oh yeah, Disney owns ABC. And then he asks me, you got kids? I go, yeah. He says, have you seen any previews recently for a Disney movie? And I said, holy In a single day and night of misfortune, the island of Atlantis disappeared into the depths of the sea. A Disney cartoon. And I say, well, no, you are shitting me, right? Are you telling me that Walt Disney Corporation has told ABC to make a documentary about Atlantis in which people say Atlantis is real and that that's going to be part of their marketing strategy for this full-length feature cartoon called Atlantis, The Lost Empire. He says, Kenny, you just connect the dots. I'm not going to say that. And I said, dude, you sound like a nice guy. I know you've got a job to do, but we're done talking. It was a 90-minute infomercial for the cartoon. It was an amazing experience for me because it, I, I recognized at that point that so many of these shows are about entertaining people and has very little to do with science or what the evidence or data actually show. Scientists in a responsible way tend to want to qualify their answers and broadcast hates that. Hello, I'm Janine Krippner. I'm a volcanologist at Concord University, currently a postdoctoral researcher studying explosive volcanic eruptions. Major newspapers used to have science reporters. These are rarities now. The New York Times, I think, is one of the few papers left that has a science reporter on the staff. These are from the Daily Express from the UK. Yellowstone volcano warning. Super volcano will erupt and could end civilization. Alaska earthquake. Fears grow for Mount St. Helens volcano eruption after 8.2 quake. Vesuvius eruption warning. Europe's super volcano threatening. It's boiling. Iceland volcano eruption imminent. Katla volcano threatens colossal ash cloud over Europe. Indonesia suddenly hit by two huge earthquakes leaving ring of fire on alert. Yellowstone volcano eruption warning. Hundreds of bison dead as fears of mega blast grow. None of these are based on any science or anything that scientists have said. These are all completely false. But once you have the Volcano Observatory saying one thing and then the media headlines shouting another thing. I don't expect people to know who to listen to. And this was the case with the Agung eruption. People in Indonesia, many of them were tourists, they didn't know where to get the right information. So all they had access to were these headlines. It's unbelievable the things that turn up in tabloid headlines, which are not based on any kind of fact or truth at any volcano around the world. I am Sam Popa. I've first been in contact with the media when an, uh, an eruption happened on Iceland. And um, since then, journalists contact me whenever they need background information on eventful volcanic eruptions globally. Sam is a friend of mine and colleague over in Belgium. They end up with me because I'm one of the few Dutch-speaking volcanologists at a Dutch-speaking university in Belgium, so that's why the Belgian press ends up talking to me. He also works with media to help people understand what global activity is going on, or if there is information in the media that needs to be addressed. I knew that uh, when, when talking to the press as a scientist, you need to be on game, on, on topic. Um, I mean, balance your words. 
uh, when you speak. Um, I guess I wasn't prepared for the way we get quoted or represented in the media. There was a seismic crisis in Iceland and what, what often happens is the question would be when will this volcano erupt? It's a very typical classic question asked and a logical one of course, but we can't say and especially me, I'm, I'm not directly involved in the volcano monitoring. I would have no clue. So I responded, it could be tomorrow, uh, the day after, in a week, in a month, in a year, in 10 years, in a hundred. I don't know. And the headline the next day said, we can't exclude the eruption will be for tomorrow. Now that is fear mongering in my opinion. And yeah, I was pissed, <laughs> that's for sure, yeah. I definitely gained a lot of experience in the meantime. What I have been doing recently is calling out journalists on Twitter. If I would see a misrepresentation or fear mongering in the press when it comes to volcanism, I would respond on Twitter publicly with the correct information or uh, a link to an article that correctly represents the facts and is still interesting to read. I've had it on the radio also, a radio interview this summer about the, um, the explosion that happened during the Kilauea eruption where, where the lava flow entered to sea, there was an explosion, some, some volcanic material landed on a boat, some people got injured and they were clearly after blowing it up, they, they took the, the online uh, audio recording, put that out on the radio. <laughs> and then asked what's happening here, explain this. I explained, wow, that's just a small boat coming too close to a small explosion of lava entering the sea. It's just a boat that probably came too close. Adding that I was not there, so I do not know the context of this specific case. And the director would sit next to me and in the breaks, take off your headphones, Sam, you need to make it bigger. You need to go bigger. People want sensation. That was national radio news. Our task as scientists is to bring it back to realistic proportions. So I, I try to bring it down to those normal proportions, but it's a, it's a continuing fight, definitely. I'm a comedian and a writer, but I have half a finger in the science world. I get, I get people, friends of mine going, oh, you're a scientist. I'm not a scientist, not at all. But people make that mistake and they try and hire me to do things where I'm always very clear. No, I'm a comedian who knows a bit about science and plays in that world, but you will get represented that way. My friend Brian gets it a lot. So far, I've only seen one clip of strange evidence that I'm in. Science journalist Brian Mallow. They identified me as a science journalist. Then they go on to say he examines, examines the latest advances in robot technology and believes they could explain the bizarre tentacled appearance of the object in the footage. So I'm a science journalist with a specific beat. Well, no, I'm a comedian, science comedian, but I do not identify as a journalist. And if they're calling me a science journalist, that just makes me wonder, there's another person identified as a science journalist. You kind of hope it isn't dangerous. Maybe he's a ventriloquist, what do I know? The funny thing about the process was the producer kept trying to get me to say certain things and I was like, I, no, I, I, I can't say that. I'll say this. And he, and there was this back and forth. And I know he was getting a little frustrated because he wanted me to play up the drama of how scary this is. And they didn't give me the videos to review until the night before we were shooting. And when I saw them, they were not what I expected. They were all sort of pseudoscience things. They were, they were, here's a strange thing in the desert. Now, on a Native American reservation. It's almost as if it's part human, part animal, some sort of hybrid. Are we dealing with some supernatural creatures here? Is it a disembodied shaman? The thing seems to be a human turning into an animal. No, it isn't. Based on all the criteria that I've looked at, I think it's a cat. And then another one was about a Bigfoot-like creature. The monster from your worst nightmare. Is the footage proof of an abomination? These creatures are real. 
and you don't ever want to piss one off. Could it have been this Bigfoot of the South, whatever they call it? The skunk ape. It could just pinch your head right off. And one was a weird ghost-like thing where a woman in Mexico is on the street and sort of gets slammed down to the street. A schoolgirl walks out of a shop and is slammed head first into the ground. They were like trying to like, well, so what did this to her? Is it like ghost-like? But it's like, well, I see a wire. You see there's something pulls her down. I don't know if it's set up or a weird accident, but I said, but I see a wire there. And they go, oh, well, the first version we saw of this was lower resolution and we couldn't see the wire. So could you just act like you don't see the wire? In a country with a cult that worships the dead, are evil spirits taking victims on the streets? And act like it's a very mysterious thing happening. And I'm like, ah, uh, <laughs> no, I don't know if I can do that. In fact, in the same episode I'm in, there's a segment about the Devil's Sea. Now, a boat full of people are drawn to a strange vision. These people clearly don't think they're in danger. An otherworldly glow splinters the darkness. You have no idea what's happening here. And then all of a sudden, bam! This story is so dishonest. The whole first part of it, they're building up the suspense and drama. Passengers on board a ship are transfixed by an unearthly display. It's crazy yet beautiful. Thick clouds boil on the water, lit from beneath by an eerie red glow. The sea's on fire. It's about some people are on a boat and you see this imagery that's foggy or smoky and red. A boat full of people are drawn to a strange vision. And something very mysterious. They're playing up the mystery. And then... Murder, She Wrote doesn't tell you this guy was the murderer in the first minute. There's no show, so you go, oh, could it be this? Could it be that? There's a place somewhere else in the ocean that's kind of like a Bermuda Triangle where many ships are lost. You've probably heard of the Bermuda Triangle, but there's a, an equivalent out in the Western Pacific where ships are more likely to go down for some reason, which many sailors fear. Known as both the Devil's Sea and the Dragon Triangle, it's a stretch of ocean with a grim reputation that goes back centuries. Sulgut believes that a rare and destructive oceanic phenomenon could explain these mysterious disappearances. But he has a good science explanation for it. It has something to do with methane bubbling up, and it's very dangerous for boats. You can often have methane gases that come up from the bottom of the seabed, and these bubbles come rising up. By the time they reach the surface, the sea is just boiling. If the ship is sitting on top of that, it no longer has the buoyancy, and it just goes right down. In a way, you get sucked in because you're like, oh, that's a good science explanation and it can be swamped within a second. If that's what's happening here, these people are in terrible danger. But then after all this talking and building up and it's like, could this be it? Another person comes on and goes, The Devil's Sea by definition is the 750 mile stretch between the coast of Japan and the island of Iwo Jima. But this footage was taken on the other side of the Pacific near Hawaii. So it must be something else. They spent like, okay, what, what did we just experience? They just built up a mystery and then said, well, it can't be that, because that isn't even where it happened. So that's weird nonsense. Planetary scientist Cyan Proctor thinks the strange red glow looks familiar. All of that steam that's being generated and then the glowing red color, I immediately think lava flow flowing into the ocean. It wasn't mysterious. It was a tour boat that was intended to get close to a volcano to witness these lava flows. The video itself wasn't originally posted as a mystery. It was posted as a lava bomb. The lava bomb exploded right next to the boat, blasting it with steam and hot rocks. So that's what they saw. That's what they knew it was. That's what they posted and said it was. Imagine if they'd been just a little closer or if the lava had punctured the ship's hull they would have sunk to boiling water. Was it a devil sea? Is it another Bermuda Triangle? Or is it what the guy who posted it said it was? I was on a tour boat and there's a volcano. Why are you asking me if it's a devil sea? There was no, <laughs> it's absurd. The passengers are lucky to have even survived it all. The most mysterious thing in all of this is why they thought they could get away with this or, but I mean, they do though. Maybe that that's very naive of me because 
All of my marine scientist friends were really upset a couple years ago when Animal Planet put out these mermaid shows like a mock documentary. We had just found a creature of fable. All of us had been wanting to say it for, for days, probably weeks. What we were looking at was a mermaid. There was footage in a submersible where all of a sudden some scary mermaid hand touches the window and they're claiming that mermaids are real. The thing is, a lot of people believed it. The deep ocean has been their last hiding place. But now, even here, there's no refuge. This is all fake. There's another one. I think it's supposed to be in Israel. And it's up high, looking down at some rocks on a shore at what looks like a mermaid, like, scrambling into the water. What is that? Oh, my what God! Is, what is that? That documentary, not only was it fake found footage, but it was exposed by CNN for hiring actors and calling them scientists. It even featured guests purporting to be scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Actors who have IMDb presences playing scientists in this fake documentary. And it turns out Dr. Robertson is not really a scientist. Thank you, CNN. My marine scientist friends were shocked and horrified. Many watching Animal Planet's Mermaids, the new evidence, saw it as proof that mermaids do exist. On Twitter, there were so many people saying, I knew it. And of course, why else would there be all these similar stories from all over the world about mermaids? But it was all in the name of entertainment. And they could claim it's entertainment, but you had to look real closely at the fine print at the end titles for any acknowledgement that it's not a real documentary. If you watch the show closely enough, Animal Planet did include this disclaimer during the closing credits. Certain events in this film are fictional. So, mermaids aren't real? But the result was a lot of people were like, oh, I knew it. Mermaids are real. I love the BBC. I worked for the BBC for six years. But there was a program called Alternative Medicine, The Evidence. I'll find out whether these needles really do have healing powers. And in a groundbreaking experiment, I'll discover something truly astonishing about acupuncture. And I was kind of interested in alternative medicine from a skeptical point of view. And so I tuned into this program. There was a series of three programs. The first program was about acupuncture. And I thought, great, this is called Alternative Medicine, The Evidence. So it's going to be a scientific look at it. And it was on BBC Two, which is kind of our, probably our most reliable TV channel. It was produced in partnership with The Open University, which has a strong academic foundation. And it was presented by a professor of the public understanding of science. So I thought, right, this is going to be uh, what I need if I'm going to understand whether acupuncture works or not. The opening scene was a woman in Shanghai having major heart surgery. And instead of a general anesthetic, this surgical team is using a 2,000-year-old technique for controlling pain, acupuncture. And there she was, her eyes were open, you could see the acupuncture needles, and she was having this major heart surgery. And I thought either that's the most amazing thing in the world or there's something sus suspicious here. So I'm a physicist, so I've got no idea really what's happening. So I started contacting acupuncturists, heart surgeons, anaesthetists, anybody who might have some idea as to what was going on. And I eventually got a report from the Royal College of Anaesthetists who'd seen the original footage and they'd written a report for the BBC on what was going on and they sent it to me. And sure enough, this woman was having acupuncture and she was not having a general anaesthetic. You know, her eyes were open, she was, she, she was conscious. But what the report pointed out was instead of general anaesthetic, this woman had three of the most powerful sedatives known to mankind. Although sedated by drugs and her chest numbed, she'll be conscious throughout the whole procedure. So in other words, there were so many drugs pumping around this woman's body, it didn't matter whether or not she had acupuncture. You know, the acupuncture was purely cosmetic. So I submitted a complaint to the BBC, um, which was rejected, which was very odd. So I applied again, uh, I appealed, and that was rejected. <laughs> I took it all the way to the trustees and eventually the complaint was upheld. And I think it was agreed that this was a misleading piece of footage. I remember the doctor stuck a needle into my hand and felt my pulse. 
Then he put another needle in here and here near my vein. Then my whole body started to tremble. When the scalpel started to cut the bone, I could hear it all. But I didn't feel any pain, not the thing. I think scientists see something on TV, they meet up for coffee the next day, they moan about it, and they never do anything. I was the only person that complained about this footage. Nobody else complained. There were heart surgeons, acupuncturists, lots of other people in a much better position than me to complain, but nobody else did. You've got to be tenacious, okay? If you have expertise in, a, in an area and you see something that's, that's being inaccurately portrayed, I think you have a duty to, to call up the journalists at the very least and say, there was a mistake here. Documentaries, maybe a third of the ones that we do are really high quality and they're actually interested in our opinions on the subjects that we're talking about. Maybe two thirds of them are really more focused on uh, excitement. This is Countdown to Apocalypse. Sometimes you can clearly tell what they're up to. They're trying to dance around a subject to get you to grab on the topic that they already know they want. Fire to across a great new city. In an instant, a great scattered flame will leap up. This clearly refers to enhanced volcanic activity on the planet. Yellowstone volcano, it has a very impactful history. There have been some enormous eruptions, but there's also a lot of small eruptions that are occurring. And if you just look in terms of the likelihood of different kinds of events, small events are much more likely but that's not exciting for a documentary. They want us talking about the worst case scenario. There's a quote that says that civilization exists by geological consent, subject to withdrawal at any time. They have us in there more or less to just confirm their independent research. Our quotes are irrelevant to uh, useful in, in framing the subject. And at this point in time, humans don't have a really obvious way of changing the game. They talk about the crazy past. Think about logically if the last one was maybe 640,000 years ago. And they want to make it seem like maybe that's going to happen soon. Are we on course for it to erupt again? Often you'll hear uh, documentaries claiming or using quotes to make it sound like Yellowstone is overdue for another giant eruption. With the Yellowstone supervolcano on a hair trigger, global disaster may be close at hand. Volcanoes are not on timers where it has a certain amount of magma that recharges and then it explodes. That's not what volcanoes do. The geologists are not concerned. They're not really worried about an upcoming eruption. As the geothermal countdown keeps ticking away, one question remains. When will we see the realization of Nostradamus's deadly prediction? Even if the geologists are not saying that they're worried, they'll talk about what's happened in the last 10 years. Since 2004, scientists have observed the ground above the Yellowstone caldera bulge 10 inches as the magma pocket expands below. And then they'll just say, But recently, scientists have shortened the fuse. But none of the scientists they're talking to are actually concerned. They're having nameless scientists that they're using as a prop to make it sound like things are more dire than they actually are. The most recent one being about 640,000 or so years ago, and some people have suggested, well, it erupts at a supervolcano level once every 600 to 700,000 years. And they come up with an average and they say, are we on? course for it to erupt again. They play with the numbers. So they, they tell you that the average is 600,000 and it's been 630 or 640,000 and therefore it's overdue. But if you actually did the arithmetic, it's more like 730,000 is the average. So they're just trying to force it to be overdue. And if they do that, then they can get people scared. Geologists have generally believed that a supervolcano needs to stew for up to 200,000 years before an eruption. But recently, scientists have shortened the fuse. There's a few problems with that. There's no requirement that it ever has a fourth eruption. Most of these systems live and they eventually die. They peter out. So there may never be another giant eruption at Yellowstone. Second, there's no clock down there that says, okay, it's time to go again. It's natural process and it can change. They're really not interested in what you're saying. They're not listening to what you're saying. Those around the world who survived the initial eruption 
may end up envying the dead. These documentaries create a lot of fear and anxiety in the public uh, about something they don't need to fe feel anxiety about. And so then we have to spend a lot of our time, instead of looking at the science or trying to figure out what's going on, we're spending a lot of time responding to the public and trying to put them at ease. Hi, I'm Jonathan Davis, and I'm a shark researcher. I was contacted by a production company when I was doing research in Louisiana and wanted to come film me doing my research for a Shark Week episode. So that's what I thought they were going to come and do. Jonathan Davis and his team of scientists arrive at their first destination, the brackish waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Initially, they only said that they wanted to come film me, do my research for a Shark Week episode. While their main objective is to find and track bull sharks, the team is also tagging any species they can find, thriving in these low salinity levels. I absolutely love Shark Week. I grew up watching it, and it was always kind of my dream as a child to grow up and be on Shark Week. So they had me at hello. Oh, Grab it, grab it. Yeah. All right, got it. Watch your hands. Hold the head, hold the head, hold the head. Oh. Yeah. Don't get bit. While the scientists continue with their processing, they are constantly reminded just how powerful these sharks can be. My research that they filmed during the show that was presented on the show was called Team Scientist, and the other one was like Team Fisherman or whatever it was. The first species blimp spots is the silky shark. I was told that they were going to be filming us and another team of scientists down in the other southern part of Louisiana. I've been shot, I've been stabbed, I've been run over, but I've never been scared like I am right now to get in this water. Team Fisherman was a bunch of shrimp fishermen that they filmed doing ridiculous things out on the water. I got yeah. something for you. As Blimp descends to hand feed a silky, a bigger predator is honing in on his cage. They threw a big hog in the water and got the, the one of the big fishermen to jump in the water and they didn't mention anything about how it was gonna be filmed or how it was gonna be portrayed. Right now, Blimp's in that cage trying to feed one of them sharks by hand. I tell you what, he's got more nerve than me. During the interview that lasted a few hours, at the very end, one of the last questions they asked, they asked me if I'd ever heard of this rookin or voodoo shark. That was the only mention of it the entire two days we were together, which turned out to be the name of the show. Whenever they started doing the filming, I was actually fishing for sharks, so it's what I would have been doing anyway. Let's go ahead and get a foil tag on it. The team quickly tags and measures the shark. Measurements, so we got one meter six. And finally six take a blood sample meter. for analysis back at the lab. And this will uh, tell us a lot about its osmoregulation, and some salt content, how it's tolerating all this change in salinity. All right, ready? Yep. Watch your hands. Another shark tagged in the area. At the end of the interview process, they had asked me two questions. They asked me if I'd heard of the voodoo shark, and my answer to that was obviously no. And the next question they asked me was if the bull sharks could be living in the waters behind us. We were on the bayou, so my answer to that question was sharks are pretty amazing creatures. All of them have been found in weird places, so I'm not 100% certain that it would happen, but it could happen. They were insinuating that I was out there looking for the rook and shark. They took a shark expert who has a reputation that he cares about and he comments on it and they edit it in such a way that it seems like he believes in this thing, which he absolutely doesn't. They believe that if there is a monster shark entering Lake Pontchartrain, it would likely be sticking to this area where the salty waters of the Gulf meet the fresh waters just outside of New Orleans. So they made it seem like I believed in the voodoo shark and that it existed. Not only is that dishonest, you're messing with that guy's career. All of a sudden, he's got a reputation as, a, as an, a scientist who believes in this mythological river shark. He never said that. After the show aired, I cooled off for a few days and then initially sent them all an email. I asked them what the heck happened, why didn't they use more of my science, why did they lie to me, I didn't get any response. There's no mystery as to what they're doing. 
they're trying to sell the sizzle. They're trying to get viewers. They're, they're bringing in the bait. Unfortunately, I think that there's a lot of pressure for news outlets of TV shows or any venue uh, to be entertaining. And that creates a huge incentive to create infotainment where you're just creating the illusion of good information or well-sourced information. The champion promoter of Wu on national television is Dr. Oz. I was asked to be on the Dr. Oz show to talk about the science behind alternative medicine. When it comes to fully accepting the potential powers of alternative medicine, some in the medical establishment may be the biggest holdouts. I was essentially the token skeptic. You've shown you're not afraid to test the time-honored traditions of alternative medicine. So why is your doctor? I don't know whether a scientist going on this show is helping to communicate science or adding credibility to this false equivalence argument. In a way, I think maybe it is better that there is at least one voice of science or rationality, and maybe they'll slip something past. Joining me now is Dr. Stephen Novella, a neurologist and assistant professor at Yale University School of Medicine. He's an outspoken critic of alternative medicine. The producers of the Dr. Oz show uh, talked to me about the fact that I would be there to present my interpretation of what the science has to say about alternative medicine. Is it legitimate? Is it not legitimate? Does the scientific evidence support it or not? Well, you know, there are a lot of doctors, of our viewers, yeah. who are very much against these types of treatments. Acupuncture is sort of a classic example of it. Just explain to me why it's such a big deal if patients are using my it. My job is to advise my patients based upon my understanding of the scientific evidence and, you know, again, what makes sense. And I spent a lot of time reviewing the acupuncture literature. I've written a lot about it. And the evidence overwhelmingly shows that acupuncture, in fact, doesn't work. If it worked, I would have no problem using it. There was a calculated risk in terms of, well, we're still, we still might be able to get our message out and get some exposure and I could manage the risk of putting myself basically in the hands of a hostile editor who is very much wants to promote the opposite message of the one that I'm interested in promoting. There are billions of people around the world who use acupuncture as the foundation of their health care, as the basis of ancient Chinese medicine. I, I just think it's very dismissive of you to say, because we couldn't take this idea that exists with a different mindset and squeeze it into the way we think about it in the West, that it can't be possibly effective. But I wasn't dismissive. I said I carefully reviewed the literature and the research. And I didn't say it couldn't possibly work. I said when you look at it, it doesn't work. So I don't buy the argument that because it's somehow ancient wisdom or used by a lot of people, that's the argument from popularity, that, uh, that it works. Therefore, you know, people were doing bloodletting for thousands of years, and that was the standard of care. I mean, we don't think anyone thinks that bloodletting is a good way to go these days. Most producers and filmmakers don't go in going, we are going to deceive our audience. They go in going, we are going to make a show about this interesting thing, and we are going to present a range of viewpoints, some that agree with what we agree with, and some that don't, and we will combine them into making a show. And I think it's potentially a mistake to ascribe intent where, in fact, they're just trying to make something. But Dr. Oz is all about creating false equivalencies. There's two reasons you might not be able to show that it doesn't work. And one of them is you don't understand it well enough to study it the way it has to be studied. And there are many examples of that where we have struggled to understand things that we now know to be true, but because you couldn't put our arms around them and couldn't study them in mm -hmm. an insightful way. His essential point at the end was, well, science can't really study Eastern beliefs like acupuncture, so we could still claim whatever we want and believe whatever we want. And your science isn't powerful enough or doesn't understand how to study acupuncture, which of course is a point that we've addressed often and can easily refute, but I was never given that opportunity. I think the average person watching this episode of the Dr. Oz show would come away with the impression that there is a legitimate scientific controversy over whether or not acupuncture specifically and alternative medicine in general works or is backed by adequate scientific evidence, when overwhelmingly the, the consensus, the evidence is that it isn't. I mean, if it, the joke is, if alternative medicine were proven by science, it would be... By definition, I begin, alternative medicine, I continue, has either not been proved to work or been proved not to work. Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proved to work? Medicine. medicine. <laughs> I'm doing this show today to arm you with the information you need to make the best decisions about GMOs 
for your family. So here to help me make sense of it all are Dr. Pamela Ronald. She's a leading geneticist in the field of GMO plants. She's a professor of plant pathology at the University of California, Davis, and the author of Tomorrow's Table, Organic Farming, Genetics, and the Future. Food. Yeah. She's a colleague and she had a pretty bad experience on Dr. Oz. She again was, was paired with Jeffrey Smith who was in our interview also um, and another individual from an activist organization. Also with me is Jeffrey Smith, the executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology and the author of Seeds of Deception. Basically the three of them were on stage simultaneously. Dr. Ronald, talk to me about GMO foods and what you see as their future. Okay, so at first it's helpful to know what we eat, we eat every day. So everything we eat has been genetically altered by some sort of methods. Yeah. Genetic engineering is another process, which is a very precise process. And indeed, one of the um, interesting aspects is you can take a gene from a different species and insert it. So if we can uh, create a different type of agriculture, a more sustainable agriculture, by integrating our best farming practices and the best science, then we have made uh, tremendous benefits to our children and our grandchildren. The way that the interview went down, she really had very little opportunity to actually state her points or actually rebuke incorrect information that was given specifically by Jeffrey Smith. Well, I work with doctors all over the world. I published a book called Genetic Roulette, the documented health risks of genetically engineered foods. We found 65. We found GMOs were linked to thousands of sick, sterile, and dead livestock, thousands of toxic and allergic reactions in humans, and damage to virtually every organ and every system studied. Jeffrey Smith appears very honest, and, and he's a very good salesman, but he has no scientific expertise, and he's got some very bizarre beliefs. He believes in yogic flying, which is something like bouncing along on your ass and considering that you might take off from gravity or something along those lines. I mean, these are not alternative scientific opinions, they're alternative in a very, very dramatic way from where the evidence is. The points that are raised by Jeffrey Smith have been widely um, refuted. I urge the audience to go to academicsreview.org, biofortified.org, ucbiotech.org. These are all um, university-based information sources. So here's the problem. You know, this is, I see this frequently in lots of different areas. The population that believes that GMO foods are safe will believe they're safe. The population that believes they're not safe is not going to believe they're safe. And it doesn't matter if you go and read a website. Well, so convince me. Yeah. I'm just sitting here. I'm asking. No, no, I'm, I'm, everyone watching this program sitting at home asking that question. They're saying either you're full of it or Jeffrey's full of it. So we were a little nervous to go on Dr. Oz because she had had such a, a bad experience in terms of allowing the facts to, to come out. In fact, that's part of the reason that we did eventually agree to go on because it was to vindicate <laughs> Pam's appearance there. It was so dreadful. And uh, it was right after the Serellini study had come out as well. There was a recent study that came came out looking at rats who were given genetically modified food. The Serolini's group fed uh, two years of genetically modified corn to Sprague Dolly rats, which are the type of rat that every science experiment uses to study cancer risk. The methods that they used, in addition to the fact that they did, you know, use the uh, rat breed that within two years, 80 to 90 percent, especially of the females, would have these gross tumors, irrespective of what you did. And th these are tumors coming out of these animals? Yeah, most of the female rats got breast cancer, most of the male rats got intra-abdominal cancer, there were problems with the kidneys, the liver, and the pituitary. Glyphosate is the herbicide that was used in glyphosate uh, tolerant corn, which is the, ex the, the type of corn that they used to just demonstrate uh, that there was a potential response uh, to eating genetically modified food. So the glyphosate is the actual herbicide itself. Now, if you're expecting that this is because of GMOs, you would expect a greater response the more you give. In fact, the animals that had the highest quote unquote dose had the fewest tumors. And in fact, the animals that came out best were the ones that were given pure glyphosate in their drinking water. So go glyphosate, yay. <laughs> but it was his show, it was his platform, it was his editing room <laughs> and I think no matter what we did, he was going to make sure it came out the way he wanted. And we were purely there as props to feed the position he wanted to have presented. He got yeah. a congressional hearing yeah. over you know, his statements around weight loss products. You've been trained in science-based medicine. Now, here's three statements you made on your show. You may think magic is make-believe, but this little bean has scientists saying they found the mag magic weight loss cure for every body type. It's green coffee extract. Quote, I've got the number one miracle in a bottle to burn your fat. 
It's raspberry ketone. Quote, Garcinia cambogia, it may be the simple solution you've been looking for to bust your body fat for good. I don't get why you need to say this stuff because you know it's not true. So why, when you have this amazing megaphone and this amazing ability to communicate, why would you cheapen your show by saying things like that? I think he went on the, before Congress and says... I actually do personally believe in the, in the items that I talk about in the show. I, I passionately study them. I recognize that oftentimes they don't have the scientific muster to present uh, as fact. Oh my gosh, that's exactly what you have to have before you promote something to people. Otherwise, it's just snake oil. And he knows that. That's what I find perplexing as a scientist. It's like you've got nothing but your scientific integrity as a scientist. And he sold his integrity. I mean, he may be a fine thoracic surgeon, <laughs> but clearly he has absolutely no desire to be an honest broker when it comes to science. I can't pretend to know why people think that it's okay to completely make up information for money. I don't know how these people sleep at night. I'm Dr. Riko Muranaka. I'm a doctor and also a writer, so, but I don't uh, really write for the medical journals, but I only write for the lay people's magazines. And I've been covering many, many topics, but the topic mo I got most responses was the HIV vaccine issues in Japan. My name is Michael Fitzpatrick. I'm a GP, a family doctor working in Hackney in London, where I've been working for the last 30 years. I'm also the parent of a young man with autism and learning disabilities, and I've been involved in the campaign around the claims of a link between the MMR vaccine and autism over the last 20 years. Vaxxed by Andrew Wakefield was about to be shown in Japan. The film distributor of Vaxxed in Japan, after they consulted with doctors and the pro-vaccine organizations, announced that they will stop showing it because the content of the movie was not reliable. Japan provided the most interesting insight of all. Japanese had a unique experience with MMR. Introduced to replace single measles, mumps and rubella vaccines in 1998, within a short space of time it became clear that their MMR formulation was associated with an unexpectedly high incidence of meningitis, caused on the face of it by the mumps component. The public rejected the vaccine and it was officially withdrawn in 1993. That short video showed Japanese government pulled out MMR vaccines reflecting the voice of the people. The video was telling a lie because the image on the banner was stop mumps, not stop using vaccines. They are actually marching for the vaccines, not against the vaccines. But they deliberately shadowed mumps and highlighted stop with yellow. So it was a pro-vaccine parade. In the early stages of the Wakefield campaign, I think certain sections of the media were uh, excessively impressed by Andrew Wakefield and showed a degree of credulousness in relation to his claims. And as we know, Andrew Wakefield was struck off by the British General Medical Council. HPV vaccine was introduced in Japan in 2013, April. But only two months after that, the government made a very strange decision to keep the vaccine in the routine immunization program, but to stop recommending it proactively. Right after that, the vaccination uptake dropped from 70% to below 1%, and right now nobody is vaccinating with HIV vaccines, while it is used in over 140 countries in the world. It's had the effect of, of persuading many parents not to have their children immunised at all. And so we've seen the return of measles and mumps, uh, diseases which we thought had been completely eradicated. So it has had a very damaging consequences, this campaign. I got probably more than 10,000 responses to my articles. I and my family got so many blackmail messages. <laughs> it's mainly like, I will vaccinate your kid if you have one. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, but... Japan's decision to stop recommending regular human papilloma virus or HPV vaccination will cause thousands to die from cervical cancer. That's according to a recent study reported by medical journal Lancet. 10,000 worms will be lost per year for another 10 years if we don't use these vaccines. That's 100,000 worms. Whereas expelled was a rather uh, professional job and all the more dangerous for it, this Australian film was amateurish. 
I was approached by a woman in Australia who said she was touring Europe to make a film about evolution and its reception. She just had a little camera which she sat behind and she did the talking and the filming at the same time. And then she asked me a question which only a creationist could possibly have asked. Can you give an example of a genetic mutation or, 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 or an evolutionary process which ha can be seen to increase the information in the genome? Well, I knew then that she was a creationist and I had been duped into allowing her into my house. I then had the dilemma, shall I throw her out or shall I proceed with the interview? And I paused for 11 seconds while I debated in my mind whether to throw her out. And it had been edited such that the 11 seconds while I was pausing to decide whether to throw her out, which made it look as though I had evaded the original question and tried to get out of it by answering a totally different question. It may take more than a kiss from the princess to turn a frog into a prince. There's another version of this film in which she does not ask the question at all. Somebody else does. They got an Australian man in a completely different setting, I mean, in Australia, to ask the question. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? And then cut to my 11 seconds pause. Immediately after the 11 seconds, they spliced in the answer to a totally different question. There's a popular misunderstanding of evolution which says that uh, fish turned into reptiles and reptiles turned into mammals. This, this has gone the rounds of, of the creationist websites showing Dawkins was stumped by this, uh, this question. That's the most extreme right. example that I know of. They outright manipulated those interviews and those edits, and it's dramatic. I doubt if many intelligent people would be fooled by that one. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I think when I'm asked to be on camera is will I be represented properly? Will I be taken out of context? That's huge to me. And every time I talk to someone in the film industry, I already am concerned. I'm already worried. To the dishonest producers out there who, who make these shows, you have skills, you have knowledge, you have money. Do something good with it. Don't waste your time with this. If, if you want to make shows about the ancient world, I want to help you. I want to be involved in that. I want to promote this material. If I could say anything to you Hollywood producers that have screwed over scientists like myself over the years, I would say there's no reason why you should be fear-mongering or sensationalizing these creatures because all the cool actual facts that are behind sharks and living creatures in general are enough to bring in crowds and to really make young people love them and want to study them. The ocean is filled with wonders. Why don't we just talk about the wonders that actually are real? We need to build a relationship between scholars and scientists and media people because these, this outreach needs to happen. To the producers, I would say, why didn't you fact check your sources, your subjects? Where is the science in this documentary? If I could address everyone in the chain that produced that documentary, I would say, crew, I had a fantastic time working with you. You guys were so much fun. But everyone above that level, producers, editors, you can't just take it and collapse it into a nice, neat, completely pristine soundbite because that's not science anymore. So come, join us on the frontier. Tell the real stories. Let's go do this. To you folks who are out there doing the work to make these shows about the human past, about science in general, number one, don't do anything unethical. Oprah, if you're watching, you don't like to be deceived like you were with James Fry and his Million Little Pieces incident. And to the audience, I want to say, this is baloney and Oprah and her show deceived you. And that's wrong. I don't know where the trust got broken, uh, but it needs to come back. And I want it to come back. Please stop cutting people into pieces and rearranging it. If you're producing something and you have a narrative and you bring on a scientist and what they say does not fit your narrative, don't edit or cut or camera trick them into saying something that does not represent their research, please don't do that. Call me. I'll do it. I'll say anything. I, I have no scruples. <laughs> <laughs> you can't use that.
Alexa, define the word skeptic.